Hello, Castech community. This is Chris C, the founding director of the Castech project, coming to you today to talk about the evolution of software distribution. So in the previous talk, we talked about how content or media types of different sorts, from videos to images to 3D and augmented reality, is what drives the distribution of content and ideas on the internet, and that drives the adoption of platform, whether that's Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, or Fortnite. And so content distribution is a really important part of understanding what spreads on the internet and what get people excited and how uh, ideas permeates and become viral. Software is what enable these platforms that distribute the content to become the superpower of today. So today we're going to kind of look at the other side of the coin, which is instead of looking at, uh, at the internet software and networks and community around con from the content perspective, we're going to say, what is the software Right? What is the distribution mechanism of the software to make that all happen? And we're gonna take a slightly longer view this time and zoom out and not just looking about the the idea of the recent growth of platforms in the platform economy on the internet enabled by the distribution of the World Wide Web and mobile ecosystem, but look a little bit about what is software, how it's been distributed, and how in this new world we're moving to with decentralized community building, how that it actually becomes a history and evolution that we can not only understand, but also draw ideas from as we design the future distribution system for software. So let's look at it at the most simplest level. Uh, there is a time where to use a computer, you have to write your own software. But quickly, people realize that that's not entirely possible. Most people, 99.9% .9 of humanity, do not write software. So what we need to do is have people write the software and deliver or distribute that software to the software user. The user will use the software to go about their daily lives, make things, create content. But the idea here is we're going to focus almost exclusively on how software code that has been written can be distributed to the user. So let's begin. We're going to use a mnemonic called the PQRST method, which is just thinking about the evolution in the different phases uh, represented by one of these uh, letters. And the and you know, mnemonic here is that we're going to look at software starting as a product. Uh, when Microsoft is the king of um, software, how those boxes of product software becomes the unit of distribution. Then we'll look at quotes about how consulting and system integration becomes the primary mechanism. We'll look at resources, especially around the advent of the web, and what kind of web resources. Software as a service, otherwise known as SaaS, is the current zeitgeist of how software is distributed. And we're going to project that out, software as a service, and say what comes after that, and which is the idea that we're proposing as software as a tool, and what is the characteristic of a tool. So let's look uh, at software as a product. So the year is 1995, and Microsoft just announced that they have gone to Goldmaster, which is the final copy of Windows 95 and Office 95. And that is now available on the physical store, CompUSA, and these different types of retailers that sell software. And people were lining out the door. They were literally as excited about the release of Windows 95 as they are a, you know, a decade or two later of the initial iPhone, right? People thought that this was a seminal moment in software where this office Windows 95 things is something worth lining up for. And that's what happened, right? The distribution channel is the wholesale distribution of the code into Goldmaster, which is a final copy of the software because you can update these things. You have to send a new CD out, CD-ROM out to update the version. So the physical store becomes the primary way for distributing this information with the retail box, which includes a license key, which gives you the ability to make the thing to the user and the user essentially install it and, and, and have a way to use it. But how do you know that this happens? So the media part of it is that you read about uh, um, you know, computer programs and software and hardware from magazines. You discover the magazine, the distribution channel of the ideas and you buy the product in the physical store. You gotta get it before you can install it, unwrap the box and use it uh, on, your, on your program. Now, obviously there's a humongous opportunity for people to package this to get together. The reason why people are excited about Office 95 is instead of having to buy Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Access separately, you can buy it in one box and it contains everything. So it creates a great, tremendous opportunity for an aggregator like Microsoft to either build or buy software pieces and put it together in a suite and that suite called Microsoft Office contains everything you do 
for the next 10 years or so for people to go about their lives. And if we, if, if we need a new capability, you have to wait for the new upgrade, Office 97. And then you go and buy a new box with a new key, uh, and that allows you to kind of upgrade. And that seems archaic today, but in the desktop era, that was what drives the majority of value creation in the tech industry, stock prices, and that software as a product. And that's worked pretty well. So fast forward almost 15 years. That's when Apple decided in the mobile era to follow exactly the same path. So instead of distributing uh, information on the retail store, they created a digital store model after the iTunes music store where developer creates the code, package it now not in the CD-ROM, this is all virtual or uploaded, uh, a zip file of sort, and then they upload to the app store. And the App Store provides the ability, uh, instead of using magazine, nobody reads magazine anymore, through social media, user discover the apps that, oh, someone is using this new thing called Facebook or Twitter, and the user either buy or install the app. And, and for the beginning of App Store, there was a lot of apps that was available for 99 cents, 2 dollars almost like you're buying a box, except it's virtual. And then you download the app and you can use the app. So there used to be a category of top free and top paid, right? You know, most people are like, oh, there's a free app and there's a paid app. Uh, but that's like kind of 50-50. But now we're getting to a point where most app you get from the app stores are uh, uh, free. Uh, and then there's in-app purchases, or in some cases, as we talk about in a little bit later, it's attached to a service you subscribe to. But one of the nice things about the, the App Store digital model, this kind of digital distribution, is that if the developer decide to update the app to the next version, you can just click update or update this, and then it will get the new version. And that's a tremendous improvement over the boxes, and you have to deal with different uh, versions of the software and different CDs that you need to install. Uh, so I think it's a great improvement. But notice how similar software as a product is in the digital app store era from the physical thing it's still software has to be bundled together and that version of it becomes a, almost a physical artifact whether it's digital or in a box and users have to work on that and you cannot use any of the capability of the data or content unless you install the software and that's a really important thing is that these there's two paths getting it to the marketplace getting it installed before you can start using it so that's software as a product so looking at kind of the consumer aspects of it in the app store, we can definitely see the value of kind of packaging this. As, but the truth is software is not ever completely out of the box usable. This is especially true for businesses and enterprises where even in the days of Microsoft, you know, having different, you know, server side product and a client side product and consumer product and small business and big business product, there there needs to be some customization and integration for these tools to really work for you. You just don't open up an accounting package from a box with a Microsoft thing on it and then install and have it working. You still need people to help you make it happen. And this is the second, like P to Q. Software is a quote, right? A lot of software, especially after the turn of the century, uh, millennium millennium really require a lot of hand holding for it to actually work for people. So companies like IBM pivoted from selling PCs and hardware to really dominating the whole world of uh, system integration or, or what we call build versus buy. So this is really the model that works, right? Which is a IT manager has a need. They know that certain types of software out of the, out of the box made by Microsoft or, or Oracle or something like that can kind of do what they want, but they need a consultant or reseller to come in and say, you know what? I know how to use these off-the-shelf software, commercial off-the-shelf software, combine it to a statement of work to integrate and refine the scope so that you can get the software that is uniquely available and, 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 and appropriate for your business. So the workflow goes like this. The IT manager talk to the consultant, and then about half the budget goes into specifying the, the commercial software, like certain Microsoft product, and then a SOW, or statement of work, to go and do the integration and customization so that on the server, the user get what they want. So the user end up using this customized software that's half off the shelf, half customized. So build versus buy has always been, you know, not really a, a, a discrete choice, really a continuum between how much do we build, how much do we buy. And that has been this kind of business that really allow company like Accenture and IBM to grow and then there's smaller variants serving uh, mid-market and smaller businesses. Now, obviously, the, the the less the budget, the less expensive the software needs to be and and, and the more important it is uh, for someone to really guide you uh, in, a, in a cost-effective manner. Uh, P 
people were pretty happy with this, and you know, people were able to move. Uh, companies were able to adopt uh, uh, techni te technology uh, with this handholding provided by the consultant. And then a little bit later, about ten years into this kind of uh, 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 software being redefining how business runs, uh, there was a frustration with the process of this, you know, these kind of big proposals uh, and big specification where you have to define upfront what you want to do. And there's a field uh, that that came out called agile development, which is is there a way for us to more easily adjust business requirements to software so the software doesn't become some product that you install and customize and it just does not change, but becomes more of a conversational process. So while this is very similar in the shape of the previous kind of enterprise consulting diagram, what changes is that there's an, a role of the product owner to continue to iterate what what is, what is called user stories, what, what you want the software to do. And you write the code, your users use it, and then we iterate on what you need. So we make changes you know, every week, every two weeks, every month, every two months uh, to what the software wants to be. And the software becomes a live, living, breathing, changing thing versus something that just goes on a shelf or gets deployed on the server and never touched again. And agile development really didn't have a big market leader. There's many, many agile shop that understands how to uh, 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 discover the needs and work with stakeholder to make software less of a scary capital investment and more of a continuous uh, improvement that allows this software that people are using to be much more responsive and much closer to what they need. Now, let's be clear. Sometimes the stakeholder paying for these agile development are not the users, and hopefully the closer the loop it is between what the user needs uh, and what the stakeholder is communicating with either an internal or an external team, the more likely the code uh, uh, comes towards that. And that's the idea of all this uh, going beyond just budget and S W and quote and this idea of a story point, which is like this is a complex thing. Do you really want it? Do you want something that's a little bit easier that gets you uh, 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 there faster? So agile development really demystified software and made it cheaper and easier for people uh, to accept. But it's still custom software. It still requires this. Hey, you don't get the feature you want until iteration five or ten weeks from now. Maybe iteration fifteen. Maybe by iteration twenty. You still don't get the feature you want. Uh, it is still software development. It still uh, have a lot of risk. Uh, what changes that the components off the shelf or the commercial software has leaned away from open uh, uh, proprietary software, where I'm buying this Oracle product and customizing, and more using open source framework and using APIs that's third party modules, these kind of puzzle pieces to go and make this. Not make growth uh, to a lot of the open source toolkit that consultants, these small, uh, many agile dev shop that learns this toolkit and start using these toolkit as a way to uh, 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 cheaply, focusing mostly the money on the people who are programming, a lot of times in pairs, two developer, four developer, six developers, mostly writing custom code. And instead of 50-50, it would be the third party too is a very, very small percentage of the budget. And most of it is about people really understanding uh, uh, your, your task and turning it into software as a service. Now, the dial back a little bit. Um, the, while this is going on, uh, there there are there is a important things to kind of re remember. Like software was sold as these products for a long time, but when the web kind of came along, software kind of disappeared behind this idea of the web, and the web, you know, is really about the idea of resources. So. Let's take a look at this particular diagram, right? So in the previous you know, idea, whether that's custom or off-the-shelf software, codes were distributed and then you kind of download it. But on the web, at least especially in the beginning of the web, once we figure out what the web is good for, there's this idea of a, a gateway to databases. So yes, you can go to the web and make an HTML page. So this is like a document, right? So this has text and picture, pictures in it. The users use it and they get uh, the information that they need. They use a search engine to crawl for these web pages, recipes, people's home pages, new information, Wikipedia pages. It's all kind of in this really nice uh, loop where you don't you don't see the software. You just see these documents that's hyperlinked together, and you go from surfing to one to the other. But what's nice about it is that the server that's serving this web page can choose to do two things. It can either read a file that you've uploaded to that web server, like a res recipe that you just wrote in HTML, and serve it up, or 
if you have a database of recipe, let's say you were a publishing house that has 40 years of recipe from a David in, in, in a magazine, you can turn that database into a type of a virtual link, a deep link, and say, search the database for this record and then serve it out as it was just a resource. You don't see the database. You just think, click on this link. You thought that someone went there and made 4,000 web pages. But in fact, it's a program code that is connecting the idea or the illusion that these are individual web pages with the fact that it's actually coming from a database. It's coming from another protocol. It's coming from an enterprise system that gives you a record of either a department or organization or product. But from a perspective of the web, what the web sees, these are just independent web pages. And Google really came to be the superpower that we see because it was the best as crawling this open web of resources with that as created by people that was dominated in the beginning, but all created by these gateway program or common gateway interface or CGI, which was at the time a way to write software that connects your internal system or your assets into this open web. So that's really, really great. Web 1.0 allow people to really imagine what an interconnected, completely boundaryless uh, richness of information where Google and maybe a number, some, some other search engine can help you uh, get there. The problem of that is that the only way you can make money making your recipe available as a resource, right? Because it's open, it's anybody can access it one click away, is to put advertising on it. You can't say, I'm not going to give you the information and you pay me. That payment mechanism was not built into the web. The monetization in the open web with software being a resource generator is just advertising. And Google really took that uh, as, as not only a software distribution method, but also as a monetization for this particular model. So the user is using the web browser, first and foremost, they don't think of these recipe websites as software, right? Like I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not using a recipe software from this company. I'm just using a web browser and that piece of recipe that's generated by this gateway is just invisible, uh, completely behind the scene, behind my experience of browsing the web. And then, you know, kind of going back to the model of, you know, installing software as a quote, with this emergence of the web, the web browser being the app that people use, now you can serve more than just resources or web pages of recipes and contents and Wikipedia articles. You can actually serve out entire application that used to require installation behind the firewall or inside your data center to do accounting. So the best example, the mostly uh, most successful early leader was a company called Salesforce.com. Uh, Mark Benioff, who's the founder and CEO of Salesforce.com, used to be a, a very high level executive at Oracle, which sells software as a license, as a product, and sells services with partners and themselves uh, to provide this enterprise system. But there's a whole lot of installation and finger magic and it's millions and millions of dollars to even get one system customized and installed before one user can enter the information about their sales pipeline or the conversation they have with the customers. And Salesforce.com came and say, the web is so great as a way to allow people to just click on the link and access information. Why couldn't we take all the type of application that used to require installation and put it on the web? And what they did was they took the code uh, that would be uh, uh, written in uh, for, for a client server or for a type of a deep enterprise application that requires you to have a pre-installation and said, you know what, if we use HTML as the method and we hide the database behind it, we can create an app that we can host for the users, right? So that all they have to do is go to www.salesforce.com, create an account without installing any software beyond the web browser, right? The web browser is a piece of software, but it's something that's basically available everywhere. And then they can start paying us a subscription instead of having to do that initial investment. And the customization of what is your region and territory, that can all be done through the web software. And that's the beginning of multi-tenant software where one website, salesforce.com, can create different accounts for different companies and grow from one company to a 10,000 company and then getting more and more subscription revenue and delivering entirely through the cloud. 
So that's the idea. The, the web browser is doing two things. It's both the discovery mechanism to find out about salesforce.com. It's the way you subscribe to begin the subscription. A lot of time clicking on and providing a credit card so it's easy to procure. You don't need a purchase order. You just need a credit card number. And then it's also where the web uh, the applications deliver. It is very straightforward all the way through. The user gets the value. The sales team start coordinating the activity almost right away. This model of no software, software as a service, really Really make way for all the software that we now know of today. Very few of them really require you to install software. It really is about get accessing through the web. Now, obviously, you, you, you say, well, it's not always through the web. Sometimes software as a service still has a mobile app. So using the example of Salesforce.com, Salesforce.com actually offer a mobile app that you can download. And then if you download that app, you can use your mobile device to connect to Salesforce.com. But here's the important part. This is not like software as a product. We are not selling the Salesforce.com iPhone app as a product for $29.99 one time, like how you would sell box software or even downloads. What we're really talking about is that you have an existing subscription to the hosted service, the software as a service Salesforce Fry. And all the App Store is doing is distributing the code that you have written for iOS and maybe Android in a bundle to the user. And then the user basically gets in like, thank you for delivering or distributing the on-ramp. But what I'm really doing is I'm going to the host server to get access to the database of contact that I made in Salesforce.com. The, Salesforce, uh, the, the App Store is no longer really a store. It's really just a way to get the the, the tool to, to get on ramp. But yeah, now you still have to install the tool, but the monetization happens at the surface layer, even though it taps into this digital distribution that the app store is supposedly for. And this is going to be important later on as we talk about the business model of what will uh, hopefully succeed and replace software as a service. Now, let's be a little bit more technical and, and zoom out a little bit and say, okay, Salesforce.com was successful building uh, uh, this uh, software stack pioneering how you build this enterprise database that can be accessed on the front end. Now, obviously, a lot of people, a lot of company, big and small, has come and 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 really jumped into the in, into fray and say, hey, we can also offer chat as a service, which is Slack. We can offer a type of help desk service, Zendesk, and there's many many companies that does different things on the web that you can just subscribe to using just in a web browser. If we peel back what Slack, Zoom, and ServiceNow, and all these different companies do, what you're gonna see is that it became a lot easier to create software as a service because of the public cloud. So Amazon obviously is a store, but they created this division called Amazon Web Service, which allows any developer to basically create your code and deploy your code to the cloud, to the Amazon cloud, both on the front end and the back end. And then you don't have to worry about creating your own data center just to create a software as a service. So all you have to do, basically, is to write the code and let Amazon Web Service take care of hosting in the cloud for your customer, whether they're on a desktop, laptop, or mobile device, to go onto your application. So what we're seeing here is this idea of what we call a uh, um, deployment pipeline, where once you create the code in the back end, you push it to the cloud. The cloud takes care of the delivery of the each button click and the images and even the hosting of the database. All you have to do as a developer to enter software as a service is to write the codes. Okay, we call this back end biased, and this is going to be a, a, a idea that I want to kind of really un, have people understand. Because we need to push things to the code and we need to have this API that the users interact with, right? All of the actual front end stuff, the user experience is actually delivered first to the back end, and the back end, the server, essentially deliver that to the user as a secondary step. So the code goes to the back end, the front end code comes from the back end get delivered, and the user gets a full experience, okay? So a back end bias system means that a lot of what developers do on the day-to-day -day basis is to write the code, and the way you write code is that you check it into a source code repository. So it's like a shared folder, a uh, uh, Dropbox for developer, and GitHub is the market leader for coordinating these workflow. A package registry is a little bit like 
if someone already wrote the source code, already wrote some you know templates or libraries or useful bits, and then say, you know what, you don't need to make a calendar anymore. I already made a calendar. Why don't you, instead of writing the calendar in your code, just take a module that has already implemented a calendar, already implemented a video player, already implemented a form validation to make sure that you type in your email address correctly. So that when you write the code, you can focus most of your time in the toolbox, only most of the code is done by other people. 20% of the code is what you write, 80% is what you borrow from other people that's writing that. And the way that worked was through open source. So open source is basically saying that I want someone to use my software that I wrote, right, for free, right, so that they don't have to do that again. And used to be that you have to basically work for Microsoft to create a library for calendar within Microsoft's Office Toolkit. And then other Microsoft developer would get access to it because it's included in Windows. But open source is radical, right? So anybody who is working on a calendar thing for booking website can say, you know what? Now that I have written the code for my customers, I'm also going to make my source code available for other people to reuse. And I'm going to give it away for open source. There's a lot of reason why. One is um, it's easy to make source code available. Two is you can be proud that you've shared your code. And, and third one, probably the most important motivator is a developer gets jobs because open source allows you to show other potential employers or your peers how good you are at writing high quality reusable software. And that leads to opportunities so you can get hired. So whatever reason it is, open source is a way where the developer through this ecosystem uh, both tap into what has already been written and then add to that when they feel like they have solved a problem uh, and, and they want that problem to be shared. And this idea of uh, the modern dev workflow, the modern development workflow, this is the picture. When someone says, oh, I'm starting a new software as a service company or I'm starting a new marketplace, this is likely 95% identical to what they're actually building. Um, and one of the big challenge here is package management. So when you have written a lot of code that depends on a lot of people's code, right? When those code change, like the calendar is updated to take care of a new leap second or something like that, you have to update your code and bring it in and sometimes to say, well, I, ha I have three places on my website that uses an image service. And that image is now changing format. I want to make sure my site still works. So most of the time that the de developers spend on its picking where they want to depend on other people's code. So you want to depend on something that's reliable, well-maintained, and high quality and well-accepted community. But you also have to deal with if they update too often, do I catch up now or do I catch up later? And this is a great deal of, uh, 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 of stress and work for developers. But the good news is you have the world's registry of, of content to tap on. And almost everything you want to do has been done once by someone else. And you can start there looking for shortcuts to get your job done. Package registry in the JavaScript ecosystem is called NPM, which I think stands for no package manager. So it's for people writing software in Node.js, which is a JavaScript runtime on the server. They can share the JavaScript code, not only for the back end, but also on the front end as using NPM as this kind of shared uh, space. Uh, and that's a really big part uh, of, of what allows uh, people to quickly get something done in NPM. It's an important part of the open source ecosystem, so much so that GitHub uh, bought them uh, recently. And now uh, NPM is part of GitHub, which makes this distinction between what is a source code repository, what is a package registry, increasingly blurred. So for the purpose of what we're going to go on, we're going to combine the idea of a source code repository and a package registry into something called module catalog. The only real difference be between a package registry and a source code catalog is whether something is zipped up, basically. It's whether it's combined into one like zip file or you have the individual raw thing. For all intents and purposes, you can go from one to the other. You can't really go from a package if the source code is not available. But since we're talking about open source here, let's just assume that your source code for your calendar control and the package is basically two forms of the same thing. Now, with these modules being in the catalog, we can start thinking about uh, uh, the, the idea of how you would distribute software is a little bit different, right? So if you think about it for a second, these modules, these calendar control, right now is something that a developer has to create, right? But what if it's something that is so 
off the shelf. It's so polished that we can just like kind of combine them together uh, and then create an application just using a calendar and video control. Could we go and make a booking website uh, just for that information? Now, obviously, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Developers benefit tremendously when these modules are much closer to the finished product than apart. So what we want to see right, is a front-end bias system where the developer looks at this module and say, ah, I see what this thing can do. I see if I press a button and I take this module and put it in my app, the user will see this particular form. Now I am done. Now, obviously, this form also has a backend component. So this little crisscross thing we put into it is basically say the module catalog can, if we use JavaScript on both the front and back end, uh, when you say, I want this calendar, I want this form, it gives you the front end, the form fields and the drop downs, and it also gives you a back end to capture that. And that'll be ideal. So I think this idea of using JavaScript, using the emerging standard called the ES module, which is the European standard uh, way of defining how JavaScript shares module, uh, and that's something that's in browser, in Node.js, everywhere else, and add it to a full stack composability, which means the back end and the front end understand the same idea of what a module is. What you can allow for is this really quick uh, push to the user. But what is also really nice about it is that if the module is the place where things originate, if you were to add a new you know, button or new theme or new color, what you're really doing is that you're making the change to the module and you're asking that change to be propagated all the way to the browser. So much so that the code as you write automatically updates the website. Well, you say, well, why is that? not possible for well because of the app bundling like we have to put the thing and put in a bundle you can't just have something show up in the app store a second after you update it but because this is the web because things are connected in a real-time push basis you can make this live change in your code as long as you commit it to the module and let it say hey push it all the way to the uh, the back end now you have the ability to get that all the way through to the user in without any delta. Now, obviously the same thing happens here. Some of the work that you're doing is app specific. So it's something you've written. Most of the stuff like the 80%, maybe even 90% is off the shelf from other people module. A lot of what you do as a developer is to, to select which part of these things goes out. If the other people module change, you, you can decide to, to make that change immediately. But if you're making the change yourself to your application, yeah, you want it to be real time. And that's called runtime configuration. And once you can do runtime configuration for code, then you can do something quite interesting, which is that you can say when end user decide to make changes to their form or add a field to the template, they can go ahead and make a change from within their browser. And what happens, the change they make is that it's also as if you're changing the code and it will get pushed out automatically. This is what some people call no code, which is that without writing a software code, you can make changes to an application. But what I want to emphasize is that this particular picture of no code is dramatically different than the current software as a service with no code capability. Because we're not just changing the configuration of the SaaS app on salesforce.com, where you say add a new column and then a new column shows up. You're actually fundamentally changing the source code the, the recipe of the entire application through the entire stack of the, on the cloud, on the computer, in Git, in GitHub. And that allows there to be a level playing field between changes that developers can make to make the, so the software more powerful and the changes that users can make to make the things as powerful as well. So this idea of end user configuration allows us to tap into the ability to version Right, So developers say, oh, I made some mistake. Let me roll back the version. A lot of configuration you do on the website, if you delete something, it's gone forever. You can't go back to a version. By using no code UI, the type of environment that people are comfortable with, but actually making it modify the developer's equivalent uh, code and use Git to version manage, you get this amazing collaboration and power without uh, losing that ease of use. And that ease of use come almost entirely from just making a nice UI that modifies the configuration of module or the selection of the module, in some cases, uh, changing the data types as well. So that's no code as a tool. So 
If we zoom out a little bit and look at software as a tool and say, you know, what is the essence the gist of why software as a tool is different from software as a service, even though they're hosted and you access through a website and you may even subscribe to it, what's real difference about it? The difference is whether any module can be in any cloud, right? So right now, if you subscribe to a cloud service from salesforce.com, it has sales features and service feature. If you want chat feature, you have to subscribe to a different thing. The module, the chat, the message, the emojis, the fields, the form, the territory are specific to a particular application. And therefore, most people do, they subscribe to 10 or 12 different application, log into 10 or 12 different account, uh, and, and you have to know which one has the piece of puzzle you need. But if we move to software as a tool, kind of thinking about like a developer, right? I can have a video player within the CRM application to manage my customer. I, I want to be, I should be able to add an audio recorder to a chat room. I should be able to put an audio recorder in a, in a, in a political campaign application. To a developer, any of these puzzle pieces that exist in the package registry, the toolbox, can be used in any website because I know how to assemble it and bring any of those capability to any application. But users don't have that luxury. You get what the develop package together. You can't decide which subset of part makes sense for medical business for a or, a or a musical education business. You have to wait until a developer to put those tools, a video player and this together before you can use it. So the services have a lot of lock-in to what you can do because their particular recipe and assembly defines you know what you can do, but more importantly, that you have to do it through the service, maintain a relationship with them by way of subscribing continuously forever. But software as a tool is to say, no, the software is not in the cloud. The software is in the modules. That's where the software is. The modules define what the software to. A cloud is just where you host it. If you have you know, three modules in a cloud, fine, it's fine. And then that resource is generated by this module, right, inside a cloud so the user can access it. But let's be more concrete what happens, right? When you access this cloud with this module in it, let's call it a video editor and video player, your video is stored inside the cloud. But we have to isolate the software from the service. So the software is just a tool, it's just a hammer. It creates this video, right? And that video you can take with you the same way you can download your photos or download your email. Then you can keep a copy in your computer or USB stick or whatever. Because if this car were to disappear, they go on a business, they got bought by Facebook, uh, they got banned by your country, whatever it might be, you still have your data. But your data is just a video, you don't have the ability to edit it. But because the module exists outside the cloud, you can pick any other cloud, drop it in, right? And then say, hey, here's my data. Get the modules you need to become my new subscription-based hosting service. And they say, oh, I see what's in your data. Let me go, runtime, to the module registry model catalog and see what pieces I need. Oh, you, you were using a video editor. Oh, let me download that uh, in the cloud. You're using a date calendar control. I can download that and then recreate what you were there before, what you had with the other service provider. The cloud provider is no longer locking you in because any cloud provider that speaks the language of module-based software as a tool can recreate everything for you, right? Based on this shared open source commons of the module. And that's the idea that, that no one cloud, no one service provider, no one corporation holds your data and your creation hostage. It's a very big difference between the type of software as a service that while they are easy to use and, and, and friendly, it, there's a contract where it's like, you know, you will no longer have access to your blog post once you work out of business. And this idea of isolating the tool from the cloud is really the defining characteristic of the untethered content and data that you create with a tool. The tool is independent of what you created uh, as, uh, as, as a user. So the content and the data and the configuration is stored and synced separately like a file. So the same way you could have made a file on a 
old computer uh, from 95, that Word document, if you save it in USB stick, you can probably open on a modern Mac or modern Windows machine and reopen and see the essays and the spelling mistake you've made in the past. So this idea of using file-based resources, R for resources, is how we perceive and, 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 and isolate the content, the data, the value of those resources away from the tool itself. But obviously you need the tool, the software code, you need to load the tool to view and edit, and that's coming from the module system. But what's important about thinking about these things as resources is that the resource is where we can distribute. We can share a link, or we can share on social media, or we can post the link uh, on, on, a, on, a, on the website, or you can share it with Reddit. That distribution of a link of a resource is very similar to what we were doing in the early Web 1.0, where you can actually tell other people about something just by giving them a deep link. And this is the same thing. These resources, where while they're hosted in the cloud, exist on the web. Um, you may need permission. You may need a certain you know, really long string that's a permission code, but it's still just a link and just a URL. And these resources you create, it could be very simple. This is a video. It uses a video player module on a cloud that supports the module system. Or it could be a very complicated multimedia stories, Instagram story type of thing. It just needs four modules. The stories module, the video player, the text player, and three other things. The cloud can handle that because much like developer compose software by writing code, the module system developer uses the same module system we use to generate these compound assembly based suite of resources. And then the cloud, you know, this is the thing. People like the convenience of subscribing a service for hosting without necessarily having to do it themselves. A lot of decentralized software tend to uh, be thumb their nose that clouds are bad. People want to do on their own computer. I mean, you know, really? You know, my computer is in my bag. My, you know, a lot of times I, I can't reliably make sure that my website's up if my computer is serving the website. The idea that someone's going to do it for you professionally manage the uptime and making sure that the network is going well, it's worth paying. For. So clouds are going to compete on services to host these resources, but they do not need to build every module. They're relying on this module catalog contributed both by uh, uh, the open source community. But if they say, hey, I need a certain custom module for this quirky use case for these private school that want to do certain things, you can hire someone to go and build a module using quote, software as a quote, to create a module specific for this uh, university, for this school, and then that gets added as one piece of this puzzle where you can charge a, a, a subscription fee for it. So it's not just limited to off-the-shelf software or even open-source software. You can actually sell premium module. You, this module allows you to make a lot of money if you put it in there. But that's the idea, that the module catalog, which is currently built on the open-source sharing model, can become more like an app store where some things are subscribed to, some things are paid for, some things are custom. But combined together, they create this tool, the software tool, to allow you to create the resources to allow user to access it and ch share the information uh, uh, in a, as resources. So the data is what carries the content, the revealed content is what carries the software just comes just in time to be installed in the cloud and then be able to provide that experience as if it's been there all along. So that's the idea that real code is being written by developer Right, and that's create the majority of no code, uh, the, the the module ecosystem, and no code, which is no lo not using code and just using UI. You can configure and edit the 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 parameters, including subscribing to services and sharing it with other people without writing code. But they are one thing. The real code, no code, are not two different paradigms. They're just different user interface to access the same idea of software as a tool in the mechanism that builds on top of the cloud built on top of what we learned and what we evolved in the software as a service, built on top of the ideas apps and JavaScript and what it can do, built on top of the fact that people still want product and they still want reliable services. But no code and real code is two ways to access and contribute to that ecosystem. And we really believe that a lot of the reason why uh, tech startups are worth so much is because you always need developers to assemble these modules together and make a product suite to make it useful to people. But if Regular people, non-developer, can use the same tools, no code tools, to assemble the same parts that developer has access to. Uh, they can 
be a much more responsive to business needs and much more able to get people to uh, bridge the gap between what software can do and what the needs are in the stakeholder and the users. So no code is a really important benefit that we get once we're able to turn this software as a service ecosystem into a global shareable tool marketplace. So that's it, PQRST, software as a product and software as a quote, resource and, as, and tool. And what's important about this is that software is just all of these things. They're not five different types of software. It's just all software exhibiting the characteristics of that. And if you look at what we were working, looking on before, software is a tool slot in about here, which is closer to what developer creates and use. And users will then put some, you know, power user will create the product. Some people will support that in the service. And more importantly, user will share among the resources. And developers are not going away. They're always going to be able to, you know, through a quote, through some sort of contracts and engagement, add tools to this framework, assemble those tools together uh, to create that glue. And that's the real uh, nice things about software as a tool. It's, it's that it provides the glue between what we believe user wants, which is access something as a resource without having to install it, but they do want that flexibility and say, what if I want this to do a lot more than what Airtable can do today? Right now, you're really stuck on what their product roadmap is, but with software as a tool, you can hire developers and say, can you add that one feature when I click this button, I want fireworks because that's how I motivate my team. Cool, hire someone to create a fireworks module, add it to your tool, have that button wide up, and now you get your fireworks and it's gonna be fantastic. So what we've talked about so far is, you know, what the paradigm is. And I do believe that every paradigm shift requires a couple of things. It requires companies to be incredibly successful showing the way like salesforce.com or Apple in the App Store. But the th way things really stick, the things that becomes the reality that is shared by millions is when things become so commodified that everybody's using it. A good example is it used to be that the web was a great publishing platform and there's a lot of company building really expensive content management system and then WordPress came out. Now anybody can have a very amazing and easy to use content uh, uh, system and now 35% of the web is run by WordPress. We really believe in not just open source as library and module share between developer, but open source products and tools, complete product you can use to go and realize this possibility that has been suggested by a few big companies, but what, what if we make this the truth and commodity in the, in the distribution that everybody can see? And that's what we're doing in Codstack. So the first thing we're doing is a little geeky, which is that we're building something called CatalogJS, uh, which is a front-end bias JavaScript module catalog. No, there's nothing wrong with NPM or GitHub as a way to share source code and packages, but there are certain use cases that requires us to rethink how to reuse modules. A lot of modules today is I'm just taking my module, packaging together for my users, right? And then another app will package basically the same selection of users. I use React, I use Node.js, and they will package a completely different set for their users. So when you visit a different website, you're downloading React like a hundred times. And React is downloading the calendar control a hundred thousand times. And all of that stuff adds to the cost of Bootstrap. So we can really think about the module catalog, not just as something to give developer and have them put it on a CD-ROM, it happens to be on the web, but it, you know, it really it's just download the parts, stream the parts as you need it. It's as different as downloading a movie and waiting 15 minutes versus streaming the movie on Netflix and, and YouTube. So what we're working on Catalog.js is taking the existing NPM registry and the GitHub workflow and creating a global streaming catalog so you get the code the minute, the second you need it without any of the ceremony of downloading, which is called NPM install, and uploading, which is called deployment. Everything just exists on the web already. You use what you have. Now, obviously, there's some optimization we need to do about where we distribute it. The same way streaming. Uh, if you're streaming a movie from Singapore, there's a server in Singapore that has that Netflix show and it streams from there. So we use the content distribution network, the global system, to prepare these little parts of these modules or bundles of modules so you can tap into them. And that's what we're working on. It's a very important substrate to enable the software as a tool ecosystem that we, we conceive. And then we talked about the full stack runtime so that if you create a module, you want it to have both the front end and the back end, and that's what Costack Hub is. It's an API uh, server as well as a front end UI framework that is all based on this module. So if you want to add a new module, let's say you want to use a customer application form or like a credit card payment uh, workflow, those are all modules in the NPM registry. 
enabled by the catalog JS. Uh, but when you add that to your page, whether as a developer using code or as an end user using drag and drop, it can be in automatically recognized by the Costack Hub and say, oh, someone's trying to use this thing. Let me go and do the preparation and create the API for it. So we are trying to you know, make a version of this vision of software as a tool built on top of the modern cloud to create this full stack application runtime. Now, this is based on existing technology. You write in JavaScript or TypeScript, you use Node.js, you use Postgres, which is a popular open source database. So we're trying to stay with what is kind of popular and convention technology and just provide that convenience layer uh, for developers or non-developers to use. And then Costack Builder is the kind of front end environment for it. It has a couple components. Most important thing is that we want to extend this ability of composability module thing to end users. We wrote a no code editor. So you can add fields, you can create collections entirely by drag and drop, similar to what you would do in a no code tool or even like an Airtable or something like that. That's built on top of an open source uh, 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 framework called Ember.js, an Octane edition, the most modern version. Uh, but also supports some uh, coding, light coding thing where you can theme it using a CSS editor. And we're also working on something where if you're a developer and you want to make a live code change to this running application, you can actually connect your uh, desktop editor on your laptop, whatever it might be, and we'll actually synchronize the changes based on when you click save. So that uses Visual Studio Code, which is a great open source uh, text editor from Microsoft, uh, and we are integrating that as well. So Costack Builder is the end user interface when they're ready, they can do some light coding. And if developers, especially ones that are on the go and don't want to create their own development environment, they can actually hook up just the editor on the computer and then have all the modules and all the runtime and server in the cloud, right? Uh, and do it that way. Now, there's two important things to note. This is 100% open source, which means all the code that we've written, everything here can be deployed on your server, on your company server, or you can use a service that we will provide, or uh, maybe other people in other country takes Costack, much like they do WordPress. There are many, many companies that host WordPress you can choose from. We want a vibrant ecosystem, so we can take advantage of various jurisdiction, various privacy laws. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, uh, but we want a diversity uh, of services on top of this common code base. But the key here is that this catalog JS uh, idea for developer end up becoming a module catalog for end users. You, I really want to be able to get people the power to say if there is some developer or some other user who created a whole customer onboarding module that allows you to collect names and addresses, maybe validate the driver license, who wants to do that again? Even no code, you don't want to do that again. You can drag a card that represents that entire workflow into your thing. It's like step one, do that module, right? And that's a catalog that has a physical manifestation, which we call card. So the card catalog is not separate from catalog.js. It's just a UI layer on top of this module system we're building. And that allows the building that you're doing, the no code building to be less about I'm creating a column on the table and a rule. It's more like I'm assembling these four application together to form my workflow needed for my business. And that's really the power, the modularity and the recursion and the assembly of not only the raw part, of software, tables, rows, data, and forms, but actual high level concept of workflows, queues, approval, payments at the highest level. Those are encapsulable as modules, what we call cards, and that's really what we're most excited about building on top of the software as a tool. So the software, right? The actual software that make that form and that validation of video chat work disappear. What you see is that please fill out this form. When you have, notify me and I'll approve. That is the type of language we want people to use, not I want to make a mobile app that has these things. And Costack is ultimately about building up all the stack is necessary uh, uh, to create that experience so that the software disappears. And all you see is your content, your cards, your information that you've created. And knowing that while that information is in this cloud today, that you can always synchronize it to you, put it on a USB drive, and then later on, 10 years later, you can boot it up in another computer or new cloud, and that all is there. Because that's what the magic is. When you find a CD-ROM uh, where you burn for yourself of the papers you've written, photos you've created, uh, you look at it and say, wow, this is nostalgia. This is an archive of that, that things. And that's something that yeah, I still have. I have some uh, you know, recording as a musician I made and it's still there. It's just a file, right? But there was a period of software as a service where all these dot com came in and they're oh, block on my platform, create photos and things. Those are all gone. I have no idea the company went out of business. 
the software as a service is great when the service is there. When the service is gone, you lose everything. Software is a tool, right? If I made a piece of furniture with this hammer and this drill, I keep that chair, even if that hammer disappears. And that's what we want. We want people to own their content, not just for now, but forever. And that's the type of decentralization. That's the type of personal ownership we're looking for. And it's going to require everybody to work together. A lot of them was already done in the open source ecosystem, but we package that power that exists in the cloud and open source ecosystem into something the user can feel and touch an environment they know. Then we know the software becomes the uh, uh, the the substrate of much like air around you. It's everywhere. You don't see it, and it allows and it gives lives. And that's our goal. Uh, thank you very much for your time today, and I hope this is helpful. And there's a blog post coming in that you know provides a even greater detail on the history, less technical, uh, but I think a combination of this talk, which is about the technology and how we actually make this happen, and the motivation will help uh, us kind of go beyond the silos of software as a service and really uh, share and collaborate on the tools that will create a digital future.